Okay. Uh, we will be having a um, another person, HKN volunteer, join us to help us run the session. But in the meantime, I think we can get started by introducing yourselves. Um, and as we wait for Julia to come in, if Jim, as you take a sip, uh, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? We do have people out there waiting to hear what you'd like to say. All right. Thank you. My name is uh, Jim Conrad. I'm the uh, 2022 IEEE Eta Kappa Nu president, that would be the president for next year. I'm also a professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And Paul, let's hear from you. Hello, my name is Paul Franzon. I'm professor of electrical engineering at North Carolina State University. I'm also a director of graduate programs for our department. Wonderful. And Wahida? Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Wahida Aziz. I am the graduate recruitment specialist at NYU Tandon on the grad admissions team. Um, yeah, we're located here in Brooklyn in New York City. And Heath. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Heath Hoffman. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Michigan, and I'm also the associate chair of graduate affairs for Michigan ECE. That's wonderful. Um, as we're waiting for Julia, let's just start off with kind of a softball question. Um, it's from an, a former journalist, so softball can mean something different to me than it does to you. Um, I would like to know, uh, if I'm a student looking to come into your program, what should I be looking for? Is it a specialty? Is it a fit? Is it a professor? Is it a lab? Um, is there a specialty I should be looking for? How do you help somebody navigate these waters? Uh, Lita, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, of course, academics is going to be important at universities. Um, so, of course, faculty or the admissions teams who are reading our application are wanting strong students academically. Um, so sometimes uh, universities will give out like the recommended GPA or give out like uh, the average GRE scores if it's, if it's um, required because they want to be transparent and they want you to know what a competitive student looks like. But like then secondly, like you are niche, you're niching down when you're going into a, a master or a PhD level program. So you want to make sure that what you want out of the program is, go, is you're going to get out of it. Um, so it's really important for you to understand like what you want to do after you graduate or like what's your five year plan. And then it'll let you know, like, will this program get me there? Um, because essentially it's a two way street, right? You have to pick the university. So you want to be choosy. You're going, you're niching down. So be choosy. Like a grad program is what, 10, 10 classes. So if you don't like two or three of your, or your, of your classes, that's a third year program. So that's quite important. Um, but so be choosy at this point. Like you wanna make sure that you understand what the program can offer you and then that it's a good match. Cause of course, academics is important. And it's something that's looked at heavily. But secondly, it's, we're trying to see if you're a good fit for the program. So like, what, what are you bringing to the program? What do you wanna do with the degree after you graduate? Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's hear from you, Heath. Sure, so, you know, for our master's program, what uh, we're, mainly interested in, in terms of admissions is, you know, when you apply, you apply to a specific uh, area of specialization. So we're looking at, okay, this is the area you want to go into. Um, you know, do you, do you have like the right background? Do you have the prerequisites um, that would allow you to come into our program, take our graduate level courses in that area and be successful? So you do need to think a little bit about what area that you're applying to and uh, whether you, you know, you feel like you have the background for that area. Uh, for our PhD program, our admissions are done mostly by, by individual faculty, you know, looking through the applications, finding students that they would like to advise. Um, and so it definitely makes sense for you to do your research there uh, in terms of, you know, what area do you want to work in? What professors do you think you would like to work with? You know, make sure that you've gone through and looked through the research they've done, go to Google Scholar or something, look at their papers, uh, and then in your application, you know, try to speak knowledgeably about 
what they're doing and why you think you would like uh, to work with them. Fantastic. And Paul, let's start with you and then we'll end up with Jim. So a, a master's is deep, is in the United States, a master's in, in electrical and computer engineering. It's largely a deep professional training program. Uh, yeah, some students do research, some students do a master's thesis. Um, but for most students, it's, it's in-depth training in the area of interest to them. So in terms of selecting a school for a master's, you, know, you, you go by uh, largely what, what are they preparing you for? What's the career track that they're preparing you for? Or what career tracks can they prepare you for if you, if you have some flexibility? Uh, so, uh, and, and then the idea is that the master's graduate ends up being a deep design expert usually or an application expert uh, and is rewarded as such uh, by the companies that you work for. PhD course is quite different. Uh, PhD, uh, ideally, you have an area of interest and you apply to universities that have strengths in that area of interest or you have a faculty member that you're interested in working with uh, that you've um, found through paper research or, or, or through perusing the, the website of the universities you're interested in working at. Because uh, the, the relationship with your advisor is a very important part of a PhD. And most electrical and computer engineering programs, like Heath mentioned, uh, want to uh, uh, match a, a faculty member and a, and a student uh, in the application process. Uh, and that's a bit different than, say, physics, which tends to just admit a pool of students. Um, so, you know, what, what gets you excited in terms of spending several years of doing research on it is, is the key thing for a PhD. Thank you. And Jim. I would like to echo everything that everybody else has said, but I thought I'd give a, a real world example, and, and that would be one that, uh, that I did. And uh, I was graduating with my bachelor's, and I was looking for a, uh, a job location that would also have a university nearby that I could pursue for a master's degree. Because back in uh, those days, a little bit now as well, but my employer would pay for all of my schooling. And so uh, I looked around and, and one of the more appealing job sites and university sites was in fact, Research Triangle Park, which is where Paul Franzone is uh, right now. And, um, and I had a choice of several universities there to choose from. And based on what my, uh, my goals in my job were to get more in depth in, in what I wanted to do in computer engineering, the obvious choice was North Carolina State University because they offered computer engineering master's degree. And I did a, uh, a coursework only master's degree, um, but it was actually during my uh, master's degree that I actually determined that I might want to go more into depth and get a PhD. So like everybody else has said, maybe knowing if you want to do a master's or a PhD in advance might be helpful, but that's all right. If you decide in the process, you know, then you could make some minor changes as, as you go forward. Uh, there are two things that I would really like to get to, and we have a very short time here. So, um, I uh, probably have to split uh, people in, over these two questions. The one is, it's a chicken or an egg sometimes for students. Do they go into the workforce first, force first and then decide what they want to specialize in and then go on for uh, their advanced degree? Or do they start immediately in their advanced degree, find their niche there, and then go out into the uh, industry world? Um, who wants to take that one? Anybody? Okay, Paul, thank you. So I, I get asked that question a fair bit. And um, my advice is if you know you want to go to graduate school uh, and, and have an area that excites you, then charge ahead and start doing it. Uh, because if you go into the workforce and, uh, and particularly if you don't do what, what, what Jim did and at least start part-time, then life starts catching up with you. You, you, you get a spouse, you get a dog, you get a car, you get a mortgage, and suddenly you find you can't go to grad school. You don't have the time or the money. Uh, so uh, if you know you want to do it, then then charge ahead and do it. Maybe after a short period of time working, uh, I actually spent a year in the workforce before returning to grad school. Uh, but but if, you, uh, if you don't, then you're quite as likely to end up knocking on our doors when you're 50 years old, saying, you know, I always wanted to do a PhD, and now I'm finally going to do it. Great. 
Oh, Jim, Jim's raising his hand. Yeah, and, and, and hitting the wrong buttons. So <laughs> I'll, I'll even go a little bit further than that and say, if you are at the point where you have done your uh, four years for your bachelor's, or five years or, or six years for your bachelor's, um, and you haven't actually worked in the field yet, that's a problem because you should be spending your summers um, working as an intern or something else and seeing what this field is that you're getting into. You know, I'd hate for you to get into uh, uh, the workforce for the first time after your uh, bachelor's degree and suddenly, oh, I don't like this. And, you know, it's a little bit too late uh, to, to maybe change your mind. Maybe not too late, but you should really know well in advance that this is really something that you enjoy in the workforce. So from that respect, I think by the time you finish your bachelor's, you've had some work experience and you need to make that really hard decision. Do I forego a nice salary of 60 to 90 K depending on what your, you know, degree will get you at, with their bachelor's and, and either pay, you know, get no salary as a, as a grad student or get a very low salary as a grad student, or do you uh, do something like work and pursue a master's degree at the same time? Um, and, and really, I, I can't give you any advice on that other than you have to make your own decision with respect to, can you afford it? Uh, a lot of people have to worry about loans, but you should really be I, I'm going to push. You really should be working before you even finish your bachelor's degree. Okay. Uh, another question that I know is very high on the uh, very close to the minds of the students in this session is something that Jim just pointed out. A advanced degree is in a very a very expensive experience. Um, how does one work? to be able to afford it? Is it a mix of paid internships on the off seasons, powering through and trying to get loans and grants, fellowships? Where would you go for resources if you were a student and where would you tell a student to go for resources to help them pay for their degree? Yeah, I can go ahead um, and answer this. So yeah, this is a popular question of funding because graduate school and PhD programs, um, well, graduate schools are not cheap for sure. Um, and for students that are coming into NYU Tandon, most of them are paying for school um, through, uh, with a combination of a few things. They're getting a merit-based scholarship. So when they're applying, a lot of universities will offer that merit-based scholarship. Um, and then they're also working while they're in school, either doing like a part-time job on campus or maybe they're doing that summer internship um, or both, right? Um, and then they're also taking out loans to cover the rest essentially. Um, and that's kind of standard for students to go through. Um, look for the scholarship uh, work during your time at university and then um, take out the loans to cover the rest. Um, something I feel like people don't tap into too often is like outside scholarships. Um, so like look into like your other options, like Dame, uh, James was saying, maybe your employer will offer like a, a benefit for tuition discounts. Um, maybe there's outside scholarships that it's not attached to the university that is offered then you can apply to. Um, actually, that's how I paid for my undergrad. It was just a lot of small $1,000, $2,000 scholarships that gave me a full ride. So that can add up. Um, so look into that. Um, and then um, that's how I lost my train of thought. But essentially looking into getting those merit-based scholarships and then the outside scholarships and then like working while you're in school is how a lot of our students are paying for university while they're here. Heath, there's a question in the Q&A that asks, and it kind of follows what uh, he did just said. Um, first of all, how do you establish a work-life balance while you're going to graduate school? And is it different from the undergrad experience in your experience? Um, <clears throat> So the grad experience is a bit different. So just sort of an example, you know, our grad students will typically take no more than two grad courses a semester, you know, sometimes three, uh, but we encourage them the first semester to, to start with no more than two, um, you know, because the grad 
material, you know, sort of a quantum leap higher, a um, lot more there to uh, to get your head around. Um, so that's one uh, difference between undergrad. You know, another one is, you know, whether you're a master's or a PhD student, um, you tend to uh, get involved in, in research in some capacity uh, for master's students. Often that's through um, you know, what we call directed studies at Michigan, where you get course credit to, to, to work with a, one of our faculty members and conduct research. Um, in terms of the, the work-life balance, um, you know, it's, it's school, so it, it, it's pretty intense. Um, I don't know that the intensity is so much different than, than undergrad, um, but um, certainly, you know, you want to uh, make sure you take some time, um, enjoy your experience. Uh, you know, grad school was actually, you know, one of my more favorite uh, periods of my life, actually. We, we had a lot of fun. We had, a, I was a grad student at Berkeley. We had our own uh, softball league for the EECS students, you know, none of us were terribly good, so that made the, the competitive league for us. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there's, there's always those kind of opportunities to interact with your fellow grad students, and, and it can really be really be an enjoyable time. That's great. Uh, we have about five to seven minutes left. So um, before I ask my last question, I just want to tell our audience that um, they can come and actually meet with you and speak with you in our expo and our recruitment fair on Wednesday, October 6th. So please, uh, students, avail yourselves of all of the knowledge that you see here. Harness this and take it with you. Um, they will be meeting with people one on one and in small groups. So you will have the ability to chat, possibly interview. Um, so uh, polish up your resume and bring it on to October 6th, Wednesday uh, to this. It's in the expo section is where you can start. Before on that on Wednesday, you can actually go into the expo session and look up the various programs that are being discussed today, plus some others that are out there. And um, really try to get a feel for, you know, what looks right and what looks like to be a good fit for you. And then sign up to meet with these wonderful people. So my last question really is about um, your a graduate student being done with all of their classes. What do you anticipate, what would be a nice path for them to take? Would it be to just put your head down and do research for 12, 14 hours a day? Would it be to get some experience out in, you know, in, in industry already? Um, take up the cello? Uh, where would you go and what would you, ex you know, what would you tell a student to do? Once they're done with their classes, what's next? I mean, they've been in school for so many years. Sometimes you just don't know what to do next. Anybody want to take that one? Okay, Jim. Now, of course, it, it, it depends on if you're getting a master's or if you're getting a PhD. So, you know, let, uh, I'll, I'll address the master's and I'll let somebody else address the PhD. Keep in mind that a lot of people pursuing a master's degree, as been mentioned, they're delving more into detail in a specific area. Um, in fact, if you think about this, if you get a bachelor's degree, you get to know a little bit about a lot of things. If you do in a master's degree, you're getting to know a lot about a few things. And if you're getting a PhD, you know everything about nothing, right? So, so you got a master's degree, you know a lot about uh, you know a very narrow area. You should have been thinking about if you want to go into industry, who you would be working for with that knowledge. You should have been doing that long before, you know, a year before, a year and a half before, maybe even working an internship. So a lot of it is the preparation, right? A master's degree, if you go straight through, should take you a year and a half, two years, no more. Um, if you are uh, uh, doing it as a part-time, of course, it's going to take longer and you already have a job most likely. So if you're looking at uh, changing a job, this might be an opportunity. And again, you have to look at what your goal was from the beginning, what specific area you wanted to work in, who has that type of work, and start to, to hone in on conversations with people at that company um, applying for their, maybe even working an internship. Anyone else? And Anyone else? Okay. 
hard for the PhD student, as, as Heath mentioned. Um, PhD students often mix coursework and research um, you know, from, the, from the first semester. So hopefully by the time you finish your uh, coursework phase, you have, you have a fairly good idea what you're going to do for your dissertation. Uh, and you get started on that. Uh, it's best to keep charging forward, in my opinion. Any other thoughts on this one? Yeah, just to sort of follow up um, on Paul, right? If, if you're in a PhD program, normally you're, you're pretty passionate about, you know, the work you're doing, you know, it's, it's extremely interesting for you. And so usually, you know, you're, uh, that's what you want to do, right? That's what, uh, that's what uh, moves you is to continue learning more about your area. Final question. Um, I would like you all to take a time machine and give me the one piece of advice you would have told yourself before you yourself entered grad school. Oh my goodness, Jim. Yes, please. Yeah, that way I can get it over. Um, <laughs> since I pursued a PhD, I started my master's and finished my master's coursework only. I would have said do a master's with thesis, so I would start doing research already. And because I, I could have used that advanced work on working on a thesis for helping me write and do papers, et cetera. I would say um, I wouldn't stress out too much about needing or have feeling like I have to go on to the next level after graduating. Like I was burnt out after um, like a bachelor. So it's like give yourself some grace, take some time to figure it out. Like if you think a master's is something you don't want to do right now, that's okay. Maybe it's just like not right now, but it's something you do later. But like don't take too much time to think about it. Um, Cause like Paul is saying, life can get in the way. <laughs> so it's okay to say not right now. Um, so it's like take some time to think about it cause, it. cause it is years of your life when you go into a program. Um. In, in a PhD, uh, it's easy to get caught up in reading papers, trying out different ideas, trying to think through what your research, the theme of your research is going to be. And if you spend too much time doing that, you suddenly find um, weeks become, months become years. And so the, the earlier you can nail down what you're going to do and start doing it, uh, the, the sooner you'll finish. So in terms of my own personal experience, uh, the main advice I would give would be to, you know, take your uh, coursework, your first semester very seriously. I was in industry for a little bit before I went back to grad school uh, and uh, found the, the transition a little challenging. Of course, it all worked out in the end, but um, I think um, if I had uh, kind of spent a little more time on my coursework, a little less time on, on research related stuff, that probably would have been a good way to get a start. Um, you know, one thing I would like to say, though, in terms of people, students applying, the advice I would give is, is don't try to overthink uh, what, how the, the universities you apply, you know, what they'll think of you, right? It's, it's really hard for you to be able to gauge, you know, how we will consider your application. Um, and really more think about what is it that you want to do. And if this is something you want to do, you know, go for it and don't talk yourself out of it. Excellent advice. Excellent. So I want to thank you all very, very much for joining us today. I think you gave some wonderful advice to the students out there. Again, students, please take advantage of this HKN exclusive experience to meet with some of the top schools in the nation and come and visit them on Wednesday, October 6th. I uh, hope to see you all around the conference experience. There will be networking uh, sessions that each of you can attend. So please uh, avail yourselves of that as well and meet our wonderful students. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Dave. Thank right. Thanks everyone. everyone for coming. All right, bye-bye.